Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be with you tonight for your summer series. I was looking forward to coming to see you all in person. Bailey and I miss our Portland family so much, and we're always so thankful for the time that we had with you there. As we begin our lesson tonight, let us start with a word of prayer. Almighty Father, we, we praise your name. We thank you for all the blessings you give us each and every day. Tonight we are thankful for this technology that allows us to be together during this time of chaos. We pray that you will be with our nation, be with this congregation, be with our families, and help us to rely on you. Be with us as we study tonight, and help us to always strive to read from your word. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So tonight, I want us to think about the idea of depression. You know, depression touches everyone, even God's people. Since this pandemic of COVID-19 has swept the world, there's been a lot of people dealing with depression. It would be nice to think that we as Christians didn't have these dark days, that discouragement came only to those around us. But as we look through the Bible, people that we consider and label as heroes, they have also had times of despair. And if we want to experience a full life, if we want to help those around us who might be suffering, we must learn how to deal with depression. There are three types of depression. The first one is physical depression. This is when we're having a bad day. This is when we're pessimistic, when we're down in the dumps because of the problems of life. Times when we don't eat. Times when we don't want to see anybody. The second one is clinical depression. This can be caused by a chemical imbalance, a mental disorder of some type that leads us down a pathway that can be self-destructive. Clinical depression is very real. It is a common problem in today's world. There are many who may try to make light of this and act like it will just go away. But it will not just go away. Sometimes a little help is needed, but it can be treated. And the third is spiritual depression. We have times of doubt. Doubt, times when we question our faith. It causes us to give up, to be lukewarm like the church in Laodicea, as we read in Revelation chapter 3. Tonight, as we look at some aspects of depression, I want us to take a look at the prophet Elijah. If you have your Bibles tonight, I would like for you to be turning over with me to the book of 1 Kings, and we'll be in chapter 18 and 19. 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. We see that Elijah lived and served during the days of the wicked king Ahab and his queen Jezebel. And it was these two that introduced the worship of Baal into Israel. We know that Elisha was chosen by God to challenge the king and these prophets of Baal to try and call the nation back to him. You know of the contest on Mount Carmel, that he was God's instrument to prove to Israel that Jehovah was still God. After that amazing victory, Elijah, he sank into the depths of despair. He sat down under a juniper tree and asked God to take his life. You know, we sometimes look at men like Elijah as these super saints, but in reality, as the scriptures say, he was a man of passions, even as we are. You know what this means? That he was cut from the same bolt of cloth that we are. He had the same weaknesses, the same frailties, and the same emotions as the rest of us. We see that Elijah became depressed. You know, in the book of 1 Kings, we find two experiences. Elijah on Mount Carmel and Elijah under the juniper tree. There are a comparison of the times in the life of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we see that Elijah is at the height of his success. But then in 1 Kings 19, he's in the depths of despair. In 1 Kings 18, he is on the mountaintop of victory. And then in 1 Kings 19, he is in the valley of defeat. We are all capable of having these same roller coaster emotions. In 1 Kings 18, when it records this incredible story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, you know he assembles Israel on the mountaintop. He accused them of not being able to choose, for not standing for what they once believed in. They were bouncing between the two opinions. They could not decide on whether to, to worship the true God or to worship Baal. So Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Elijah tells them, I will call on my God and you will call on Baal. And let's see which one answers with fire from heaven. And the one that does will be the God of Israel. Baal's prophets accept this challenge and they set up their altar and begin crying to their God, but no fire falls. 
Elijah says, maybe he can't hear you. Then he suggests that they shout louder, and they do, but still no fire falls. Elijah asks them, is, is Baal asleep? Wake him up. And as a final appeal, the Baal's prophets begin to cut themselves. But that doesn't work either. No fire comes down. After all this, Elijah builds an altar to the Lord. He digs a trench around it and pours, orders water to be poured over it. Twelve barrels of water and all were used until the sacrifice is soaked all the way through. And the ditch in it is surrounding is overflowing. Then we see Elijah pray a simple prayer. And at that point, God sends fire to consume the sacrifice, the altar, and even the water. With that turning point, the people worshiped the Lord and shouted in verse 19, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Then in obedience to Elijah's command, they slaughtered the Baal's prophets. Everyone knew that God's hand was upon Elijah. And Elijah was proud of what take, took place there on Mount Carmel. But we know that Elijah is not permitted to enjoy this experience for very long. As soon as Queen Jezebel heard of what happened, she sends a message to Elijah. You have killed my prophets, and by this time tomorrow I'm going to kill you also. When the prophet of God read her message, his heart sank. And he began to run for his life, and he ran all the way to Bethsaida, the southernmost city in Judah. Bethsaida was the end of civilization. Beyond it, there was nothing but desert. Elijah was trying to get as far away from the queen as possible. Chapter 19, verse 3 tells us that Elijah was afraid. He, le he leaves his servant and he goes another day's journey into the wilderness alone. Have you ever gotten so depressed that you didn't want to see anyone? You didn't want anyone to know how down you really were. Psychologists today call it withdrawing. When Elijah finally quit running, he sat under a juniper tree and asked God to let him die. Then we see in verse 4 of chapter 19. Verse 4, chapter 19. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. You see, his ancestors, they had been unsuccessful in stopping this rebellion, and he had failed. He felt like a failure. In verse 5, we see that Elijah falls asleep. He was exhausted from this time of running away from Jezebel. And while he slept, the Lord sent an angel who prepared a meal for Elijah and gave him food and water to drink. Then he slept again, and once more the angel woke him up and fed him in preparation for his journey to Mount Horeb. And it was here that he would get away from the people and the pressures that were troubling him. And now finally, Elijah has reached his destination, about 150 miles to the south. It is this time that he has gone as far away from Jezebel as he could go and still be on the same continent. So he sits down in a cave. He wraps himself up in self-pity and thought about his situation. And while in the cave, God asks Elijah, What are you doing here? Elijah then told God this sad tale. Looking with me at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah is lost. He's feel like he's done his best for God and has been to no avail. So at this point, we see that he has a pity party. All of us like to get like that sometimes. We all have times that we think that nothing will ever work the way we want it to. Tonight, I want to share with you four things that caused Elijah's depression. The first is fear. Elijah was frightened by the threats of Jezebel, and he runs for his life. Fear is almost always a factor in depression. Many times, like Elijah, we have become afraid of failure, afraid of loneliness, afraid of not getting a job completed, afraid of not making it through school, afraid of not having our marriage go the way we'd like. Fear causes depression. The second cause of depression is failure. Elijah had a negative opinion about himself. 
He felt like he was not successful in solving the world's abandonment from God, just like those prophets who had gone before him. It's, easier, it's easy for us to think, I'm no good, I can't do this, I can't do that. We see our failures, and we don't see our successes. There's fear, there's failure, and the third is fatigue. Elijah was emotionally drained and physically exhausted. Being on the mountaintop can leave us that way. He needed rest and relaxation. Depression is always related to or seen in our physical condition. And the fourth is futility. Elijah said, I'm the only one left and now they are out to get me. He feels alone and hopeless and he has negative expectations about the future. Elijah is paranoid. He thinks everyone is out to get him and he saw no way out. Have you ever felt like Elijah? Perhaps you feel like him right now, afraid, alone, exhausted, burned out, and hopeless. We need to see what helped Elijah climb out of the valley of despair and go on to a lifetime of useful service. It can help us too. Through the experience of Elijah, God gives us some divine principles for dealing with depression. The first thing that helped Elijah was to take time off. He took time off so he could physically and emotionally be rejuvenated. He had been so busy taking care of the needs of the nations that he had neglected his own needs. When we use up our physical energy, we become exhausted. When we use all of our emotional energy, we become depressed. So we must find some ways to replace the emotional and physical energy that life and work have drained from us. If we don't, we will experience burnout and depression. Elijah needed rest. He needed food. He needed relaxation. He needed to get away from the people and the pressures that were getting to him. And so do we occasionally. No one can run full throttle all the time. We have to slow down to an auto occasionally. You know, getting away helped Elijah and it will help us as well. The second thing that Elijah did to overcome his depression was he talked through his frustrations. While he sat in a cave feeling sorry for himself, God asked, What are you doing here? Have you noticed in Scripture that God is always asking questions for which he already knows the answers? He asked Adam, Where are you? God knew where Adam was. He asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? God knew that Abel was already dead. He asked Moses, What is in your hand? And God knew that Moses had a staff in his hand. Here God said, Elijah, what are you doing? And God knew what Elijah was doing. He helped him get there. God wanted Elijah to figure out why he was there, to give him an opportunity to talk, to vent his frustrations. And God listened as Elijah poured out his feelings of anger, bitterness, and self-pity. We all have such feelings at times. And unless we get rid of them, they're going to poison us emotionally. When we have emotions like love and faith and hope, that encourages us. But there are also these destructive emotions. Things like fear and anger, worry, bitterness, hatred, jealousy, self-pity. And all these things, they pull us down a little bit at a time. We must find a way to get rid of these destructive feelings. But how can we do that? Simple thing we could do is we can exercise. Plain hard work is one way. It relieves a lot of tension. It has been proven that a person can exercise themselves out of depression. You see, the brain produces its own mood-elevating chemicals, and these are enhanced by exercise and hard work. When we are depressed, we often exhibit apathy. We lose interest in our usual activities. We don't feel like doing anything, and it's hard just to get through the day. It is a real challenge, but exercise or physical work can help cure depression. Talking is another way. Talking is perhaps the most effective way to, to rid ourselves of harmful emotions. When we talk, it is like pulling the plug out of the bathtub. All sorts of bad feelings are drained from us. Everyone needs someone that we can confide in without fear of condemnation. The head of a medical school at the University of Oregon said, More good is done between two friends at 10 o'clock in the morning over a cup of coffee than in being in the doctor's office all day long. Talking to a friend can help to bring life back into perspective, and it can enable us to solve our problems. You know, perhaps if we had more friends in this world, then we would need fewer psychiatrists. And for you to talk to others, don't also forget to talk to God. 
He too is going to listen non-judgmentally. We know that God deals patiently and tenderly with his child. He will do that with us also. The third thing that helped Elijah was to get his life back in perspective. He felt that God had forsaken him, that he was alone and remained faithful to the Lord. His reasoning went something like this. Here I am, I'm doing my best to serve the Lord, and look what happens. God has forsaken me, I'm alone, I am left, and it's me against the world. Depressed people, you know, they often feel like this. They have problems because they pay more attention to the negative effects than to the positive ones. They focus on immediate rather than long-term consequences of behavior. They are overly hard on themselves. They attribute success to outside forces and their failure to their own lacks. And in general, they reward themselves too little and they punish themselves too much. Unfortunately, we see that Elijah had arrived at the wrong conclusions. And at that point, the Lord chose to reveal just how warped and distorted his view of things had become. Ultimately, all of depression can be traced back to, to some view of distorted life. In Elijah's case, he had a distorted view of himself and of God. He needed to know that God was there and that there were others who had not bowed down to Baal. God sends a tremendous wind, a cyclone that rips through the mountainside. But God was not in the wind. Then God sends an earthquake that shakes the whole mountain. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, he sends fire and lightning, but God was not in, the, not in the fire. And then there came a still, small voice through which God spoke to Elijah. The Hebrew expression of still, small voice literally means a voice of low whispers, a sound of gentle stillness. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, wind and lightning and earthquakes are often associated with God. But God speaks to Elijah in a voice of low whispers. Though God was silent, he was not absent. Though Jezebel was thundering, she was not in control. God was and still is doing things in his time and in his way. And we need to remember that. Elijah thought he was the only one that was still faithful to God. But God had reminded him that there were still 7,000 prophets who had not yet bowed their knee to Baal. Elijah really thought that he was more important than he was. He thought that everything depended on him. You know, sometimes we feel the same way. We have to learn to keep life in perspective. None of us are indispensable. So to cure his depression, Elijah got back into the mainstream of life and went back to work. You know, God allowed Elijah to sit in the dark cave of self-pity for a short period of time. But then he told him it was time to get up and to get busy again. You see, there was a new king of Israel and a new prophet to be anointed. The time for complaints and self-pity were over, and Elijah was now needed to get back to work. With us, as with Elijah, the best way to quit feeling sorry for ourselves is to start feeling compassion for someone else. Psychiatrist Dr. Carl Menninger was once asked by a reporter, says, suppose you're heading for a nervous breakdown, what should you do? Most of us would have expected the great psychiatrist to say, go see someone, but he didn't. Instead, his reply was go straight to the front door, turn the knob and cross the tracks and find somebody that needs you. Don't sit around in isolation. Don't get all wrapped up in yourself. Don't have a pity party for too long. Get up and get back into the mainstream of life, working for God and for his kingdom. When we are helping others, we help ourselves. Elijah overcame his depression and went on for a lifetime of useful service. As we close tonight, I want us to think about one of my favorite verses. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Our world is set for work to be done. We have such a great opportunity to show Christ to those in need. We must focus on defeating depression because there are souls in need. Our nation, our neighbors, and our families need us to be ready. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you will be with us to light a fire in our soul that helps us to be a shining light to those around us. Help us to be an encouragement. Help us to be a friend. Continue to be with this congregation here at Portland. 
They have blessed so many lives, and I'm so thankful for them tonight. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his willingness to go to the cross for us. And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen.